This is Killybegs Harbour, a snug inlet of Donegal Bay on the northwest coast of Ireland. These calm waters provide shelter for the trawlers seeking safety from the wild Atlantic storms. Since the town was incorporated during the reign of James I, its prosperity has been derived from fishing. Today, the vigorous spirit of these tough Donegal fishermen tapping the shoals of herring and mackerel in the ocean beside them has made Killybegs one of the most flourishing ports in Ireland. In October 1588, after the failure of the Armada, the Gallias Girona sailed from here in a desperate attempt to return to Spain. She jettisoned 45 of her cannon before making for Lacada Point where she was wrecked. The 1,300 men who sailed in her all perished. There was originally an ecclesiastical settlement here whose name in Irish, Nacalla Bugge, means the small monastic cells. Killybegs is also the home of Donegal carpets. This is the original factory built of local limestone and pitch pine. Donegal has always had many traditional links with Scotland. In 1898, a Scotsman, Alexander Morton, brought across the craft of making hand-knotted carpets, which had been revived in England by William Morris. With the cooperation of the Congested Districts Board, who wished to bring employment to the area, four factories were built. They exported their products all over the world. Donegal carpets covered the floors in the Cunard liners, Queen Elizabeth and Queen Mary, in Buckingham Palace, and in the South African Houses of Parliament. But economic difficulties undermined the industry, so that by 1954, only this one factory remained at Killybegs, employing five people. In that year, Donegal Carpets Limited was established to revive the dying craft. It has not been easy, especially since the hand-knotted carpets have had to compete with machine-made tufted carpets. The making of a Donegal hand-knotted carpet begins far away from Killybegs, in Dublin. At the head office in St Andrews Street, the preliminary design is prepared. The dots of poster paint underneath the sketch represent the proposed colours of the wool. If possible, William Horsfall visits the location and sees the actual room where the carpet will lie. Bill, who is a Scot, trained in Glasgow and has been chief designer with the firm for many years. He selects wool samples to match the shades he's chosen. Once the design and colors have been accepted by the client, the drawing is transferred onto point paper and squared up to one half the actual size of the finished carpet. The colours are stronger than those that will be used in the wool. At the Irish Institute for Industrial Research and Standards, Brendan O'Farrell, the colour chemist, does a sample dyeing for a carpet which is about to go on a loom in Donegal. The quantity of the dye is calculated very accurately so that the colour can be reproduced over and over again. There are over 500 basic shades, and many more subtle variations can be achieved. This is scarred wool, perfectly uniform in quality, a mixture of Irish and imported wool. The dampened wool is lowered into the hank dyeing machine, where it will simmer for two and a half hours so that the dye will take evenly. It is actually boiled for an hour.
Achille Beggs, Mary McGee prepares the warp for a carpet using the factory's original peg warping board. The huge cat's cradle is made of flax twine from Northern Ireland. Approximately eight miles of this flax twine goes into an average carpet. The metal reed keeps the warps in correct order and makes sense of the complex pattern of strands. Ties will keep the shed separated before the warp is carried to the loom. When removed, the warp is chained, a technique which prevents the strands from becoming tangled. It also makes the task of transporting considerably simpler. This method of handling warp threads is also used by weavers. In areas where weaving was common, twisted hanks of warp were often seen being carried around on bicycle handlebars. Mary Ellis begins the task of separating and lining up the warp threads before they're wound onto the upper warp beam. It's the manager of the factory, Daniel Campbell, who winds the warp onto the upper beam of the loom. The girls first see that the ends of the warps are untangled as they're wound on. A final check makes sure that the threads are in the correct order before they're attached to the bottom beam. They must also be of exactly even length or the tension will be incorrect and the knotting will become uneven. <laughs> Alternate warps can be readily moved backwards or forwards, forming the spaces known as sheds, the gaps between the weave. In weaving cloth, a shuttle passes between the sheds, drawing the weft across. In hand knotted carpet making, the process is achieved infinitely more slowly by lines of knotting, which are doubly secured by the weft. These carefully measured ties enable the warp threads to be passed between the sheds in easy, hand spaced gaps. Up in the wool loft, Mary McGee seeks out the colours needed for the pattern from her brimming stores of wools. She selects samples from stock yarn to make up her colour card, and these are checked against the original colour tufts chosen by William Horsfall in Dublin. Pauline McBrearty winds the wool onto bobbins. Since she is winding from two sources, plying occurs naturally. Wool is a hard-wearing material. The staterooms of Dublin Castle, which receive 3,500 visitors a week in the summer months, are furnished with Donegal carpets, 
120,000 people walked over them during the two lying in states of presidents that have occurred this decade, and they still retain their color and depth. The possible lifespan of a Donegal carpet is unknown, since the oldest carpet has been in existence less than a century. Carpets do wear out, however. This one, about to go on the loom, will be a replacement, part of an order from England for the National Trust. Old carpets at Arlington Court in Devon, made for the Chichester family over 150 years ago, are now totally threadbare. An identical copy of the original design has to be made before it is transplanted onto point paper and squared off. In a reproduction like this, the colour presents a problem. Should it be made in the original root colour near the knot, or should the faded shades that we see today be chosen instead? A compromise has been reached. As forewoman Mary Ellison supervises the hand knotting, and checks that colours and width are correct. She cuts up the pattern for the big Chichester carpet into widths of 76 centimetres, a measurement which has been found to be ideal for the hand knotter to work on comfortably. The detail needed to reproduce an intricate pattern of this kind can only be achieved by using thousands of knots per square metre. Nellie Murphy takes the sections over to the loom, where they are secured in their correct order. Nellie has been in the factory for many years and passes on her knowledge to less experienced workers. A hand knotter needs a year's training to learn her craft before tackling the more complicated carpets. Inevitably, the work is slow. One impatient customer had to be reminded that the wool in his carpet, if joined end to end, would reach from London to Manchester, a distance of 225 kilometers. He had the letter containing this information framed and hung in the room where the carpet lay. There are two main techniques of knotting, Persian and Turkish. The Turkish, or Giordis knot, is used in Donegal. The name Giordis is derived from a town in Asia Minor, which was a famous weaving centre. The Turkish knot is more secure, so that although it needs more wool, it is generally preferred in carpet making. Nearly all Turkish, Caucasian, and all Donegal hand-knotted carpets employ the Turkish knot. How it is made can be seen clearly here as it is tied on the two adjacent warp threads. A good quality Donegal carpet has 55,800 knots per square metre. A carpet measuring four and a half metres by three and three quarter metres, for example, required over 900,000 knots. In larger carpets, the number runs into millions. When a line of tufts is completed, it is combed to ensure that none have been buried. The next operation is shedding. The weft, a mixture of hair and wool, is inserted between the sheds to lie over the tufts. Two lines of weft are firmly placed between each line of knots. They are beaten down with a carpet beater which tightens the weave.
A worker will complete an average of approximately 400 square centimetres of knots a day, using techniques similar to those that have produced the masterpieces of China, of Bukhara, Caucasia, Tehran, Tabriz and Constantinople. With a good hand knotter, there is very little waste to be trimmed off. It's Pauline McBrearty's job to replace the empty bobbins and to feed the ends through to the knotters. The rose and bronze shades of the wool perfectly reflect the taste of the carpet weavers of the past whose work is being reproduced. The neat back of the carpet contrasts with the luxury of the front pile. The looms are the original looms that were brought over from Scotland when the factory was started. The vast warp beam of Canadian pitch pine weighs four tons. Loom spikes driven into the beam hold the carpet in place as it is wound on. In these old photographs, precisely the same looms are in use. Ever since the Donegal factories were built, the hand-knotting carpet industry has had to struggle to survive, and it is still endangered. The market for these high-quality carpets is relatively small, and the order book remains thin. 27 people are employed here at Killybegs, but ideally there should be more. There are not enough skilled weavers to make up a full team for every loom. A Donegal carpet compares favourably in price with Persian and Chinese carpets. Besides being hard wearing, the wool is dyed with modern dyes that are very colour fast. These Irish carpets have one particular advantage. Each is an exclusive design which exactly suits the customer's requirements. carpet, which has taken four months to complete, is removed from the loom. Robert Rogers' grandfather came over from Scotland 80 years ago when the factory was started. Wool has always been the preferred material for hand-knotted carpets, although silk is found in Chinese and Persian carpets, and white cotton in Turkish. Synthetic materials lack the particular spring and luxury of wool. Alexander Morton, who created the Donegal factories, once compared the pile of wool tufts to pearls laid side by side. carpet of this size is immensely heavy, weighing nearly a ton. Everyone helps when it is being rolled up for carrying over to the cropping machine. One order that puzzled the company was for a small piece of carpet containing 125,000 knots per square metre. 
This exceptionally hard-wearing floor covering was wanted for a lift in a luxury apartment building. Extra help is very welcome when it comes to lifting these big carpets onto the cropping machine. This cropping machine, which weighs over 30 tonnes, was brought across from Scotland in the 1950s. It is the biggest in the world, capable of cropping a carpet 13 metres wide. It travels along, working like a giant lawnmower, running many times over the carpet, taking off an infinitesimally small sliver of wool at a time to secure a perfectly even pile. The edges of the carpet are hand cropped by Edward Sweeney. The carpet has to be checked to see that no pile is buried, an operation that is called skewering or pickling. Donegal carpets can be found all over the world. London, Ottawa, Geneva, Nigeria, Kuwait, Melbourne, Washington, the reception rooms of most Irish embassies. They look magnificent in the formal elegance of state rooms, embassies, palaces and hotels, but they are just as well suited to the intimacy of a private house where the individual can choose his own design. They can interpret the ideas of a modern artist just as satisfactorily as they can reproduce the ancient beauties of Aubusson, Savonnery, or Axminster. The technique that creates hand-knotted carpets can also be adapted to making wall hangings. In Longford Cathedral, the graceful angels blowing trumpets on Ray Carroll's second coming of Christ demonstrate the versatility of a craft that has become a tradition in Killybegs.